Okay, uh, welcome. <clears throat> welcome to uh, almost the final day here. Grab some stuff. Okay, so uh, again, uh, sort of the game plan for today is uh, kind of what we've been doing. Um, again, I, I'm hopeful that it's uh, maybe helpful to you. I'm just gonna kind of continue uh, through uh, some of the other chapters here and uh, you know that's sort of the plan and then you know we go study for the final we take the final it's all good and summer begins I suppose yeah um, <clears throat> or ends depending on when you have to go back to school I suppose and for most of us it's like a week I think maybe <laughs> all right so uh, <clears throat> We uh, finished up talking last time about uh, 16, I think. So uh, I think the next one is 17-ish, I think. And uh, so in uh, chapter 17, I believe. Wrong button. Let's try that again. There we go. Move that down. Okay, so uh, in, uh, I, think, uh, it's, I think it's 17, uh, we basically started talking about thermodynamics. And we sort of uh, continued talking about probably some information that uh, obviously you've uh, learned in 1A, and that was a lot of that energy, that first law of thermodynamics involving energy. And more specifically, what we saw a lot in this chapter, again, was that delta H, which is our enthalpy. And our enthalpy, right, is our heat of our reaction. And, you know, some important aspects of that that obviously we, we knew, hopefully, a negative value for delta H pretty much means an exothermic process. A delta H that has a positive value uh, means an endothermic process. And remember that <clears throat> a lot of times, you know, we, we sort of think about uh, reactions and we think about them in terms of exothermic or endothermic. And if you remember, you know, a lot of times we maybe correlate that to the idea that a reaction would be definitely spontaneous, right? If it's sort of exothermic or endothermic, uh, you know, we think about, oh, exothermic must mean reaction is going to be spontaneous. And remember that, you know, what we're really talked about mainly in this sort of chapter here was that idea of a, a spontaneous. And again, a, a couple of reminders of, of things that we did talk about was <clears throat> just because a reaction is spontaneous, it doesn't necessarily mean that the reaction, for example, will occur super fast or may occur super slow. And remember that is kinetics, that is really that study that we talked about towards the end here of the semester that deals with really how fast or slow a reaction will take place. But really what we focused in on on this chapter really was sort of the idea as to under those particular conditions, you know, would we expect a reaction to actually occur and, and happen? And again, that's what we mean in terms of spontaneous. And as we talked about, and I think as we saw maybe one of the sort of opening slides there of that chapter, um, we can have many processes that are spontaneous that are both exothermic and endothermic. Um, so just the process of, of it being either exothermic or endothermic doesn't necessarily mean that it will be spontaneous or will not be spontaneous. So for example, obviously uh, uh, the melting of ice, for example, that's an endothermic process. And obviously that occurs spontaneously as well. So as we talked about uh, the idea of, you know, being an exothermic reaction does sort of help in the process of something being spontaneous, uh, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee that the reaction will be spontaneous. So we need to look at some other sort of thermodynamic sort of properties, if you will, uh, to try to help us understand whether or not a reaction will be spontaneous or not. And the first one that we sort of looked at uh, was delta S, and delta S was our entropy. Again, not to be confused with our delta H, which is our enthalpy. And the entropy is, is really the, the randomness Our disorder that there is, 
and sort of different for delta A, uh, delta S, for example, is uh, when we see an increase in entropy, what we're seeing is an increase in disorder. So when the amount of disorder increases, that is actually when we actually will see our entropy value uh, increase as well. And vice versa, if the disorder decreases, we see that delta S also decrease as well. And sort of a, a different sort of way we sort of think about this guy is as the amount of disorder increases, we typically see our delta S value become positive while if it disorder decreases, the delta S value typically will become negative, which is sometimes a little bit different than our normal sort of thinking about things. Again, sort of relating it back to the enthalpy that when we think about negative, we think about things sort of happening and, and spontaneity and that type of stuff. So here actually with delta S, we actually see an increase in it when we see it become more positive and more negative, a decrease in it. Also, just in terms of units as well, we a couple of reminders. Kilojoules is typically the units that we see associated with uh, delta H. Um, delta S is typically joules. The other important thing as well is we typically will see sort of a big change in, in the S when we actually change states. So when we go from solid to liquid to gas and vice versa, these obviously, as we're going in this direction, we're creating more disorder. And we would expect an increase in the delta S as we go that way, as opposed to in the opposite direction. Obviously, gas molecules are flying around, so a lot more disorder. Liquid molecules kind of come together, but a little bit of movement. And then obviously, solids sort of lock themselves into place. And that obviously would decrease the amount of disorder are again, alternatively looking at it, increase the amount of order. And <clears throat> here the disorder would decrease and we would see a more negative uh, delta S. So we could oftentimes see that in reactions as well when we think about gas molecules, right? So as we look at a reaction, if we started with say four gas molecules and ended with two gas molecules, we're going from a state of more disorder to a state of more order. And we would expect a delta S value to represent that. And we would expect it to be a negative value here. Again, more order, as opposed to if you did the opposite, went from two gas molecules to a situation where you get four gas molecules, uh, we would expect a delta S to become positive in that case. So, that's important in the sense that you can oftentimes look at a chemical reaction if you're given it and really you can almost make a prediction about the delta s of that system uh, based on what you see in terms of are you producing more gas molecules are you producing less gas molecules now when we talked about entropy it is related to the idea of disorder and we sort of saw the boltzmann equation which is basically S is equal to uh, K natural log of W, K being the Boltzmann constant. And that is 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin, I believe. And <clears throat> this one as well uh, related to W, which is microstates. And remember, this is sort of the different ways that something can be accomplished. And the more ways you could do something, there's a higher probability of that sort of occurring and obviously a sort of larger entropy. And if there's only really, you know, one way to do something, we're going to have a much smaller entropy. So for example, you know, just for example, if you take W and you, you put it in as one, natural log of one, right, it's gonna give you zero, so a very small entropy value. Again, more ways of doing something, sort of the greater that entropy value. So I think the example we saw uh, was some circles and some boxes, and again, um, 
you know, depending on sort of your combination there, one circle on one side, three on the other, you know, or versus two and two, you know, the more ways there is, it's going to be more probable that that event will happen. And again, uh, we'll have a sort of greater entropy. Lack of a better description, there's many, many ways to screw something up, right? And sort of a few ways to do something correct, right? And, and the right way of doing something. So that's sort of what we see with that equation. Now, when we talk about um, the delta S, there's usually two things that we deal with, especially in thermodynamics as well. And we usually deal with either the system or the surroundings. And when we deal with the system or the surroundings, we can um, figure out the entropy for both of these guys, as we talked about. And we need to actually figure out something to determine if the reaction is spontaneous, and that is the delta S of the universe. And the delta S of the universe is the delta S of the system plus the delta S of the surroundings. And we can use this to determine whether or not a reaction will be spontaneous. And if we do that and it is greater than zero or positive, the reaction is spontaneous. If it happens to equal zero, uh, the reaction would be at equilibrium at that point. So there is two different ways that we calculate uh, these guys. Uh, first off, the delta S of the system. And again, for most cases, what we deal with in terms of the system is obviously the reaction we're dealing with. So maybe that's a beaker, maybe that's a flask, whatever it may be uh, in that particular case. Um, that's usually what we kind of deal with. And <clears throat> this guy, much like everybody else, can typically be calculated by taking the delta S of our products minus the delta S of our reactants. And again, these little not skies, right, is under sort of standard conditions. So when we talk about, especially in thermodynamics, sort of those standard conditions, uh, we're talking about one atmosphere if we're talking about pressures, one molar if we're talking about concentration, 25 degrees Celsius, again, if we're talking about sort of uh, temperature involved. So these are the values, obviously, that you would uh, look up in a table. And also something that's sort of different for delta S than say delta H or things like that is when you do look it up in that table, a couple of things are in joules. They're typically always positive values. And lastly, uh, you will actually find values for things like um, things in their natural state. So maybe O2, N2, those type of things where you find typically values of zero for that for other thermodynamic relationships. When you do look it up in the table here uh, for delta S, you will actually see it. Also important here is it takes coefficients into account. So again, uh, if you had your 2A plus 3B goes to 2C, you would take the delta S would equal two times the delta S for C. Uh, minus two times the delta S for A from the table, plus three times the delta S from B. And again, you would add it together. And like I said before, you could look at this reaction and, and probably make a pretty good prediction as to whether or not you would expect it to be positive or negative. But remember that if you do get a positive or negative value here for the delta S of the system, it does not necessarily mean that the reaction is going to be spontaneous or not. What it's essentially telling you is in that particular reaction, there's either an increase in the disorder or a decrease in the disorder that's happening. Remember again, you do need to calculate your delta S of your surroundings uh, to be able to calculate that. So with that in mind, uh, the delta S of the surroundings is equal to minus delta H of the system divided by the temperature in Kelvin. And this was the relationship that we talked about that if you had a system here, and obviously the surroundings outside of it, if this is exothermic, that means really the system is gonna give off all that heat and energy to the surroundings. And when it gives off that heat and energy to the surroundings, obviously the surroundings is gonna pick up all that heat and energy 
and you're going to have a lot of craziness occurring there um, in the surroundings, a lot more disorder in the surroundings. And we would expect for the surroundings to be a positive number in terms of the entropy value and increase in the disorder and vice versa if our system was endothermic. That means all the energy from the surroundings is basically going to kind of filter itself into the system. And the result of that is we're going to have a negative value for delta S for the surroundings as when the surroundings lose all that energy, they're going to kind of slow down. It's going to create a lot more order, not so much disorder. And we would see that. And that's really why we saw that the relationship is that the delta S is equal is uh, sort of proportional to minus delta H. And that's also why when we look at this equation for the surroundings, it's minus delta H divided by T. And that's because if a reaction is exothermic, our delta H value would be negative. The negative and negative will turn our delta S into a positive number here for our surroundings. And if it is endothermic, our delta H would be positive. Positive and negative will turn our delta S in the surroundings into a negative number. So that's again why this negative is here. Also uh, later on we see in a formula where the negative is not there, but this is specifically for again the surroundings here. We also talked about the idea that the temperature of the surroundings does make a difference in terms of that. Again, under normal conditions, <clears throat> that energy coming out will make a significant difference in terms of the entropy of the surroundings uh, in sort of a situation where the temperature of the surroundings is really high to begin with, that added amount of energy uh, may not make a tremendous amount of difference. You may not see a really noticeable amount of difference in there. Obviously the temperature here does need to be in Kelvin. So that's how you calculate again the delta S of the system and the surroundings. And again, you can add those both together uh, to determine whether or not a reaction would be spontaneous or not. Now, we then talked about really uh, Gibbs free energy. and gives free energy is delta G. And delta G, like it sounds like, is the energy that's available to do some type of work. And we saw a couple equations here, but typically speaking, uh, delta G, if it is a negative value, the reaction will be spontaneous. If you calculate delta G and it equals zero, the reaction is at equilibrium. And if you calculate delta G and it's greater than zero, or I believe that means positive, uh, the reaction would be non-spontaneous in this particular case. Now, again, unlike delta S where you sort of have to get to uh, <clears throat> the uh, delta S of the universe to figure out whether or not the reaction will be spontaneous or not, here you can just calculate the delta G for the reaction and use the delta G value to determine whether or not a reaction is spontaneous or not. We did see a few different places where delta G sort of uh, comes into play in a few different ways that we could actually calculate delta G. Uh, the first one was uh, sort of this here, I think. Uh, delta G equals uh, delta H minus T delta S. And again, uh, these are our normal guys here. So that's our free energy. In terms of units, usually kilojoules. That's our delta H, which is our enthalpy. Also in terms of units, usually kilojoules. That's our temperature in Kelvin. And that's our entropy, usually in joules. So again here, we very common have an issue with units. We wanna make sure that we're in the same units here. And this is again one where we could kind of look at this equation and sort of figure out, you know, do we expect the reaction to be spontaneous, non-spontaneous, depending really just, for example, 
on the signs that we may see uh, for each of these guys. So for example, if, uh, you know, if Delta H and Delta S, if Delta H is positive and Delta S is positive, that means both of these guys are positive. This reaction would be spontaneous at a high temperature. And the reason for that is this part here again is in joules with the S is in joules, the H is in kilojoules. So in order for our negative part to overtake the Delta H value in terms of it, it would need to be a large temperature for it to be spontaneous. If we had a positive value for H and a negative value for S, that negative for S is going to turn this back part here into a positive number, which means no matter what the temperature is, it's always going to be non-spontaneous because it will always yield you a positive delta G. Uh, so negative and positive. So negative here and a positive S no matter what the situation is going to be, that's going to give you a negative value uh, for delta G, and it will be spontaneous at all temperatures. And our last combination, negative and negative here. Uh, negative on the front end and negative on the back end. Back end turns into a positive number. Top part turns into a negative number. So it will be spontaneous at low temperatures. Again, at low temperatures, this would not be able to overtake it. So this is a very common way, obviously, as we talked about in terms of choosing the right sort of formula, it's really kind of based on the information given to you. So if you have a delta H value given to you or a delta S value, or you could calculate it, I guess, um, this is probably your sort of best choice in terms of calculating your delta G for the reaction here. Um, <clears throat> now, we also can use this equation here that if the reaction is not spontaneous in a particular event, but happens to be non-spontaneous, whatever way you calculate it, we could use this equation to calculate at what temperature would become spontaneous by setting delta G equal to zero and solving for T and we can use sort of the rearrangement of this equation. Again, you gotta watch units on that one with kilojoules on top and joules on the bottom, but we could use that to determine at what minimum temperature this reaction would become spontaneous. Again, we know it becomes spontaneous when it becomes negative, so that's why we set it equal to zero. So ideally any temperature above that will get us you know, a negative number or obviously less than zero in terms of, of that number. Um, <clears throat> now, another way that we can uh, calculate delta G is like pretty much any other thermodynamic value. You can delta G of the reaction, take the delta G of your products minus your delta G of your reactants. And again, this is typically your table values that you would go look up. And like normal, you want to make sure you look up all these values not only the right substance, but you also want to make sure you have the right state that it's in uh, so you don't get the wrong value. And just like the other one with delta S and also with delta H, you do need to keep the coefficients into account and multiply them. And again, you can take your products minus your reactants. Here again, our delta G values are going to be in kilojoules. And we will have zero for values like O2, N2, and so forth as well. So again, this is a, another way, very commonly, you can calculate the delta G for a reaction. And again, if you're given really just the equation and nothing really more uh, given to you, that would most likely be the way you would want to do it is to, again, go to the table, look up the values, do products minus reactants and, and see what you get. Now, we also talked about sort of delta G in, in the sense of under sort of non-standard conditions. So under non-standard conditions, we can sort of calculate the delta G. And again, under those sort of non-standard conditions, we're talking about <clears throat> situations where perhaps, as I mentioned, if we're dealing with something with pressures, uh, maybe it's not one atmosphere, we're dealing with concentrations, not one molar, maybe the temperature is not 25 degrees. And there was this equation here that we saw, delta G equals delta G naught. 
plus uh, RT natural log of Q. And here, this is sort of, again, if you want to think about it, our delta G under non-standard conditions. This is our delta G under standard conditions, which is basically right here. That's how you would calculate. R is our gas constant. That is the 8.314 version of it. That's our temperature in Kelvin. And then obviously Q is the products divided by the reactants like normal. Also, again, obviously you would take your uh, coefficients as the exponents and solve for Q. In this particular case, again, we could see the effect of maybe increasing concentrations, decreasing concentrations. Again, if we're dealing with pressures, same thing with that, increasing, decreasing pressures, maybe doing it at a different temperature. So uh, this delta G here in the second equation, again, really used for uh, non-standard conditions and sort of the effect it will have on the delta G and, and ultimately sort of the spontaneity of that reaction by playing with something like concentrations. Now, if we take that equation, we of course can relate it to our other favorite letter in the alphabet, which is K, our equilibrium constant. And when we are at equilibrium, Q would equal K and delta G would equal zero, which means essentially we get zero is equal to delta G naught plus RT natural log of K. Solving for this, uh, we get that the delta G naught equals minus RT natural log of K. So we could use this formula here to relate our delta G value to our equilibrium constant value and our K value. And a reminder that the relationship is sort of our normal relationship. Obviously, if we have a K value that is large, we would expect mainly products. And if we expect mainly products, that probably means that the delta G is going to be negative and the reaction is going to proceed towards the product side. And vice versa, if you have a small value of K, that means we're gonna mainly have reactants. Delta G will be positive and again, mainly head towards our reactants in terms of what might be present. <clears throat> so obviously that would be the equation that you would wanna use obviously to solve for the equilibrium constant, anything involving the equilibrium constant are mentioned about equilibrium, that would be what you would wanna use. Anything involving sort of non-standard conditions, you're given some pressures and concentrations that again, aren't that standard conditions. This is the guy you wanna use. Anything where you're just given an equation and nothing much else given to you, you wanna use this guy and go to the table. And lastly, if you have the delta H or delta S given to you, you would want to use this guy here. All right, any questions on that there? That is, I think, the thermodynamic type chapter. Then we started talking about, I think, uh, some point, uh, chapter 18 along the way. And chapter 18 is our redox chapter. And we started talking about uh, redox reactions in general, just to make sure everybody's on the same page. Oxidation, again, meaning that you lose electrons. Other definitions we talked about that you don't see too much in our class, but if you happen to head over to organic after this, you will see sort of these definitions as well. Um, and again, these work really well when you're kind of dealing with non-metals and non-metals. Another couple of definitions of oxidation, again, is the gaining of oxygen as you go from reactants to products are the loss of hydrogen or like H2. 
as you go from reactants to products. Reduction, on the other hand, is pretty much the opposite there. It is the gaining of electrons, uh, the loss of uh, high oxygen, and the gaining of, of hydrogen. Let's spit that out along the way there. <clears throat> Now, when we talk about oxidation and reduction, again, sometimes people remember that uh, Leo the lion goes grr, or the oil rig, whichever one you like there. And again, uh, in addition to this, we talked about the idea of oxidizing agents and reducing agents. The oxidizing agent is the substance that gets reduced. While the reducing agent is the substance that gets oxidized. And as we talked about, the reason for those names is they basically cause that effect <clears throat> in the other thing. So when a substance gets oxidized, it's going to lose electrons. And then obviously that's going to allow something else to gain those electrons and get reduced. So by that process, it's causing the reduction in something else and vice versa. If uh, something gets reduced, that means it's going to need to gain electrons. And in order for it to gain electrons, it, got, it has to cause something else to lose electrons and go through oxidation. So that is, Essentially, uh, what we see here in terms of oxidizing agent and reducing agent, again, those guys are typically found on the reactant side of an equation. How we can kind of determine that is to look at the oxidation number or the oxidation state is sometimes referred to. And the oxidation number state is basically the charge the atom would have in a molecule or ion, if basically all the electrons are transferred, and remember that this may not match up exactly uh, like the charge that we associate with somebody. A couple of reminders, some things, good places to start is oxygen is typically minus two, except if it's peroxide, then it's minus one. Um, <clears throat> things in their natural state uh, are zero. So like O2 has an oxidation state of zero. Um, and usually you want to kind of go left, right. And when you add up all the oxidation numbers, it does need to equal the overall charge. So if you have something like CO3 to minus, oxidation state of oxygen is minus two. That's minus six overall. There's one carbon, but we do need it equal a minus two here, which means in this case, carbon is plus four. So the oxidation state in this case would be plus four for carbon. Oxygen would be minus two, not the minus six, which is sort of the grand total. And this is a way that we can sort of uh, figure out if something is gaining or losing electrons. And you could use, again, as I mentioned, sort of a, a simple number line to help you out. Again, positive to the right, negative to the left. When you lose electrons, you become more positive and you go through oxidation. When you gain electrons, you become more negative and you go through reduction. So that's sort of a easy way to sort of do that. You literally can just, you know, move across the line one way or the other and kind of see which direction you're heading in as to whether or not something is, again, going through oxidation or reduction. Um, so again, if you had something like iron three going to iron two, you could go, oh, iron two, iron three is over here. Iron two is heading in this direction, which means it is going through reduction and probably going to gain an electron like so. Now, we talked about balancing uh, simple uh, redox reactions. Remember that when you go to balance it, you have two half reactions. One half reaction 
is the oxidation half reaction. And for it to be an oxidation half reaction, what we know is that the electrons are basically going to be lost. So the electrons find themselves on the product side. So if you had like a metal goes to a metal, boom, boom, boom. boom. So electrons here on the product side equals our oxidation half reaction, our half reaction for our reduction means reduction means as gaining electrons. So if we add an electron here, go M in, so they'll cancel out. Uh, again, here electron on our reactant side, like it's being gained. And what you want to do is you want to make sure you have the same number of electrons in each, and then you can add them together to get the overall reaction. And my badly made up one here, like something like this. If you do not have the uh, same number of electrons in both half reactions, then again, that's a situation where you need to uh, multiply a half reaction or maybe both by a common number to get the electrons to be equal before you add them together. And the idea really behind that is whatever electrons are lost through the oxidation part will be gained through the reduction part. So they always happen together. So if there's something being oxidized, there should be something being reduced. And again, it's really sort of a total in terms of the electrons as they go from one side to the next. We also talked about sort of uh, balancing a little bit more complicated uh, redox reactions in acidic or basic conditions. And to do this, there's really a few steps that you do. Uh, you split off into the half reactions. You balance everything except oxygen and hydrogen. Then to balance the oxygen, we add water to one side. Then 2H pluses to the other side. And the importance of that is if we add water to one side, we're adding our oxygen, which is what we're trying to do there, but we're also adding hydrogen. So we need to add those two hydrogens to the other side to balance everything out. Once you do all that, you're ready to balance out the overall charge by adding electrons to balance out the charge on each side. Once you do that, you can add them back together, add back together the half reactions. The electrons should cancel. And that should give you your balanced equation. In acidic conditions. If you were gonna do basic conditions, you would add OH minus to both sides equal to the number of H pluses you have. So remember that means that once you balance it in acidic conditions, let's just say you had four H pluses on the left-hand side, and everything else, you would then add four OH minuses to both sides. These guys would then become water. And most likely you would have a water on the other side where you need to um, <clears throat> uh, cancel out and stuff like that. And then that would get you balanced in the basic conditions. A reminder that when you are done balancing either in acidic or basic conditions, it really doesn't matter which one you're doing, but it does need to be balanced really two ways. It needs to be balanced like a normal chemical reaction, which means that you have the same number of elements on both sides. And it also needs to be balanced in the essence of having the 
same charge on both sides. So if you have an overall charge on the left-hand side of plus two, when you add up everything on the right-hand side, it should equal plus two as well. So when we balance these, we do wanna make sure that we have a balance again in sort of both ways, two ways, both like a normal equation where the coefficients on both sides are exactly the same. Um, and we have the same number of elements on both sides, but also the charge on both sides uh, does need to be the same. Again, a reminder that the charge doesn't have to be zero on both sides, but it does need to be the same overall charge on each side. So once we talked about sort of that information and sort of uh, reviewing, um, balancing those sort of redox reactions, we sort of tied it into really electrochemistry and we talked about really a galvanic cell. And in a galvanic cell, we have several sort of parts to it, but traditionally in a laboratory, unlike our laboratories, most people will use a couple of beakers. And basically these beakers will have some solutions in it. They also will typically have a solid used as an electrode on each side. You know, kind of tied together through a voltage meter usually. And in addition, these two beakers would be kind of connected here. And they're usually connected by what is referred to as a salt bridge. So this guy typically will have some positive ions and some negative ions happening in there. Uh, something like sodium nitrate, sodium, you know, some type of salt solution. And the solution here, so for example, let's say this was a copper electrode. In this solution, most likely would be copper ions floating around. And let's just say for fun, that was a zinc electrode in the solution here would be a zinc guy floating around. And we'll assume this guy will work hypothetically. Electrons would be traveling from this side, which we will call the anode, to the other side, which is known as the cathode. And the anode is where oxidation occurs, which is why those electrons are basically liberated. And what essentially happens is this solid goes to copper two plus a couple of electrons given off. So when it loses the electrons, the solid copper sort of drops into the solution as these positive ions. The electrons go to the other side and it goes to the cathode where reduction takes place. And basically those electrons actually come in and combine with this guy. And basically out of solution he comes and we get our zinc plus our two electrons gives us our solid zinc. So it kind of comes out of solution onto the solid, if you will. And this is really where our salt bridge comes into play because first off, there is sort of a, what is referred to as the cell potential or difference between uh, one side to the next, which hope kind of drives those electrons over there. But if we didn't have our salt bridge, you could kind of see just by this kind of simple diagram here, if we let this thing run, eventually what's gonna happen, right, is we're just gonna keep dropping a whole bunch of positive guys into here, right? So we're gonna build up a lot of positive charge on this side. And we would also be losing a lot of positive charge on this side, right? Because we are going to be building up sort of a negative charge, if you will, because we're losing all the positive guys out of the solution. And that's where really your salt bridge comes into play. It helps maintain the right sort of ratio, if you will, of positive to negative. So as we're building up this positive charge, perhaps some negative guys travel this way to sort of balance out that buildup here while some of these positive guys kind of go this way to help keep that positive side over there a little bit more than it is on the left-hand side and help pull those electrons over there. And that's what is sometimes referred to as the cell potential. The EMF of the cell or the cell voltage. 
which again is is really calculating the cell voltage. So that's sort of our process here, as we talked about when you do get um, when you do get a uh, positive voltage, it's a good thing. We could get the overall reaction here, for example, my made up one, if we add both of these half reactions together. And when we do, the electrons will cancel and we'll get the overall reaction of solid copper plus zinc. Going to uh, copper two and solid zinc on this side. And again, if we look at our oxidation numbers, copper going from zero to plus two, again, on that number line, we're heading in the right direction there, which means again, it's going through oxidation, which is what we would expect in this case. And if we look at the zinc is going from plus two to zero. So again, kind of on that number line heading in the opposite direction to the left, which means it's going through reduction. We also talked about that you could write what is referred to as a cell diagram for these guys. And a cell diagram is basically your anode to your cathode. So in this case, our anode is our copper. So we would have something like this. Yeah, well, you can put the molarity in there if you like. I ran out of room, but it all goes in one line. This is our anode. And again, we have kind of two lines that represents the salt bridge. And continuing on to the right, even though I ran out of room, uh, we would go to our um, cathode side, which would be the zinc. Separated out by the solid zinc. And again, typically speaking, the way these are written, reactant product, you know, reactant and product. So again, that cell diagram sort of a shorthand for a galvanic cell that is commonly used. Other things that sometimes will sort of develop uh, in those things is sometimes the electrodes are gases. So there's not really a physical electrode that can be used. So sometimes, you know, carbon, uh, so sometimes graphite or carbon is, is sort of used. Also something like platinum or some type of wire like that is sometimes used in place of the actual electrode itself because there's obviously not a physical hydrogen that you can put in there, right? As sort of that electrode. And speaking of that hydrogen, we had the she, right? Which is our standard hydrogen electrode. And that was really the standard that they used to figure out really the, what is referred to as the SRP values or the standard reduction potential values. Uh, for every element, they basically just kind of hooked everybody up to hydrogen. And again, given hydrogen sort of that value of zero, they were able to determine what the SRP values were by using really this equation here that E of the cell is the E of the cathode minus our E of our anode. And we got that big table of SRP values that we've seen before. And a couple of things about that table, right, that we've talked about a, a number of times. Uh, first off, <clears throat> It's a standard reduction potential, right? Which means that all the reactions in there are reduction reactions. So they're all technically written as reduction reactions. So like zinc plus a couple of electrons gives me Zn, right? Um, and again, if we had our copper in there, the copper plus a couple of electrons gives us our solid copper. And they would all be technically written as, um, reduction potentials. But in this reaction, as we've talked about, there is an oxidation reaction and also a reduction reaction. And when we do take a value or a reaction from that table, technically when you quote the E value or the SRP value, it is specific for how the equation is written. Uh, and if we need to reverse a reaction from that table, we basically change the sign on the SRP value. Uh, if you need to multiply by a common number to get the same number of electrons, as we talked about, does not have an effect on the SRP value. 
So you don't have to worry about that. So a couple of things with this equation and one we also talked about, which is this one really, E cathode plus E anode. And again, the difference here is, as we talked about, if you choose to not change the value from the table, which technically speaking, you should for the anode one, which is the oxidation reaction. If you do not change the values from the table, you should subtract because that's why the subtract is there. It will change the sign for you. If you wanna do everything to the letter and correct you know, to the T, like perfect, I'm gonna do everything exactly correct, you technically should reverse the anode reaction. You should change the sign on the, the SRP value and then you should add it together. Again, as we talked about, you don't wanna change the sign and then subtract because you're gonna undo it. So as we talked about then and probably hopefully at this point, you have a method that you stick with and you should stick with that method, whichever way that is, either changing the sign or not changing the sign uh, to do that. Again, a lot of people will do this, but technically speaking, let's just say that the uh, E value for this guy was 0.7 volts, positive 0.7 volts. If I really wanted the oxidation reaction or the anode reaction, it would be this. And as we talked about when we were going over this stuff, if you were asked what the E value was for this reaction, the way it's written, technically speaking, the correct answer would not be that. The correct answer would be negative 0.7 volts in my made up example here. Again, just negative would imply it is that. So if I did that, I would use the bottom one here and obviously not subtract because I already changed the sign for you. So again, that's an important thing to remember. You don't want to change the sign um, <clears throat> and then subtract. But if you do want to change the sign, you should add them together. The other important thing from this table is if you are not given any information about how the reaction is actually taking place, but just simply, hey, you built a galvanic cell from these things, you can use the one that is more positive. SRP value should be reduced. And if it's going to be reduced, what that means is that is going to be your cathode in that case. So when trying to determine, hey, which one's my cathode, which one's my anode, you wanna to go to that SRP table and again, choose the one that is more positive and that again should be your cathode. The other important point of that is what we saw in many examples that we went over this semester, that if you are given an overall reaction or said, told in words what's happening, you should definitely go by the reaction that's given to you and figure out what is being oxidized and what is being reduced. And then obviously determine your anode or cathode based on that. So you can use that to help you uh, calculate E of the cell. And uh, when we get a positive voltage, so when we get E of the cell that's positive, that usually means a spontaneous process. We get E of the cell that's negative, not so good. It's usually non-spontaneous. And that's because uh, <clears throat> we saw sort of this relationship here that our delta G naught equals minus NFE. Uh, delta G is our Gibbs free energy and is the number of moles of electrons. F is our Faraday's constant, 96.5 or 96.468. Um, and E here is our E of our cell. And the reason for this is obviously this guy here and this guy here is going to be positive values. So if we get an E of the cell that's positive, we will end up with a delta G that is negative, which means the reaction will be spontaneous. And vice versa, if we get a E value that's negative, the negative and the negative will turn this guy into a delta G that is positive and non-spontaneous as well. So, you know, you don't necessarily have to go all the way to calculate the delta G in this case. Uh, just simply seeing that positive value for the voltage would imply that this reaction is spontaneous. As we talked about, obviously, you could just reverse 
you know, if you took your anode and cathode and you got a negative value, you could swap them around and it would become a positive value in that particular case. We also saw sort of uh, the relationship uh, between uh, E of the cell and the equilibrium constant. And we saw this equation here, delta E naught uh, of the cell equals RT NF natural log of K. So obviously this would be what we would use in anything involving equilibrium constant and sort of our galvanic sort of cells here. Same things, E of the cell, that's our E of our cathode minus our anode. R again here is our 8.314 version. Temperature obviously in Kelvin. N is our moles of electrons. F again is our Faraday's constant here. So we can use this relationship to calculate K and calculate E if we know K. Um, if we know the temperature and everything along here. We also saw, saw a couple of other versions of this equation, which again, uh, if you don't want to worry about that, you could just plug the numbers, you know, sort of into this equation. But again, at 25 degrees Celsius, E of the cell in this case uh, would get you something like uh, 0 0.0257 volts over N, natural log of K. Or again, we have that sort of regular log version of it. And again, if you don't want to worry about these equations, you obviously can just plug and chug uh, into that number there and everything will come out okay. We also saw that, you know, you could have sort of non-standard conditions also involving sort of your galvanic cell, or you can sort of play with things to maybe try to improve the voltage. Maybe you want to decrease the voltage of a particular cell. And again, the idea here is the standard set of conditions when we think about these things that 25 degrees Celsius, that one atmosphere and that one molar. And when we don't have sort of those standard conditions occurring, that's where we use that NERST equation, right? So that's a NERST equation. And that was our E equals E naught minus RTNF natural log of Q. So these are sort of the same uh, conditions of uh, what we sort of saw with our delta G one, this would be sort of the E of the cell under, if you want to think about non-standard conditions. This is your, again, cathode minus anode from the table. The RTNF, the exact same guys as what we just saw, Q just like normal going to be our products over our reactants again, using the coefficients as those exponents as well. And again, by maybe playing with the concentrations here, which would be in that Q, or if you're dealing with pressures, maybe playing with the pressures, uh, you may be able to see something that is normally under standard conditions, maybe a non-spontaneous process become spontaneous, or vice versa, you may have something that uh, is normally a spontaneous process, but you do something with temperature, pressure, uh, concentration, and it goes from being normally a spontaneous process to a now non-spontaneous process. So this is the one, again, typically we use when we're not sure we're at equilibrium or anything like that, and we, uh, or if we're not at uh, some under standard conditions, I'm sorry, not under standard conditions as well. But when we are at equilibrium, this again is how we got to the previous uh, formula that we were just looking at. Again, at equilibrium, as we talked about, E will equal zero, Q will equal K, which gives us this guy as we talked about how we essentially derived the equation that we just saw by rearranging this and we get E naught equals R. RT and F natural log of K. So again, that earlier equation that has to do with equilibrium constant, you know, that's sort of how we get to it from this guy as well. I will also say much like the delta G equation, it looks very similar. This one actually is 
negative or subtract here. And again, sometimes people, uh, for some reason, uh, wants to add or they want to subtract on the Delta G one. So you just want to make sure you watch out for those things. Uh, we also talked about a little bit about batteries, right? Batteries are essentially uh, galvanic cells. They work the, kind of the same way. Uh, they are basically just sort of self-contained. Uh, they're sort of an anode and a cathode. And again, um, allows really the sort of those electrons to go out through a circuit and really power some type of device and then come back and um, <clears throat> Uh, sort of be re regenerated as well. So we talked about some different types of batteries and same thing applies. You don't need to know anything specific about any specific battery. Um, again, just sort of the general idea, like probably that question was on the earlier exam, uh, you know, sort of how are they similar? How are they different? And that same knowledge will probably suit you very well here. We also talked about the idea of corrosion and corrosion really is you know, that oxidation of metals. So any metal, as we talked about, with a SRP value less positive than O2, again, is subjected to going through pretty good amounts of corrosion. And that is because, again, when the metal is less positive than our O2, in a sense of a sort of a galvanic cell situation, the metal will be our anode where oxidation will occur while the oxygen will act as our cathode where reduction will occur. So again, uh, that's why a lot of metals do go through oxidation pretty easily in air because again, it's gonna make a really a spontaneous process occur uh, because that SRP value for O2 is more positive than our metal value and it's going to allow that process of oxidation of those metals to occur. We did talk about the idea that not necessarily all uh, corrosion is necessarily bad. Some can create a pretty good layer of corrosion up on top of the metal. And by that process, again, as we talked about, uh, will kind of seal in, you know, the good metal that's underneath and thus protecting it. The problem with uh, corrosion like rust, right, is that this will fall off and obviously expose new metal to go through corrosion until essentially it kind of eats through the metal and that's again a, a bad sign. Um, certain metals that have values larger than oxygen in terms of their SRP value will not go through corrosion because for example, gold as I think was an example Gold is more positive in terms of the SRP value. So when like gold and oxygen hook up, gold is actually going to be our cathode and oxygen would be our anode. Thus gold would not go through uh, sufficient um, corrosion or anything like that. And that's one way we could kind of protect metals, right? As we talked about as well, you could paint them obviously which puts a layer of protection over them, but we can use certain metals that will basically, for example, in comparison to something like iron, we give you some metals that when in comparison, when oxygen is around, will actually have a worse SRP value than the metal. And the metal that's kind of a sacrificial metal, if you will, will then be the site of oxidation rather than the actual metal of interest. So for example, hanging like a magnesium, uh, metal on a wire to a uh, iron tank, all the oxidation occurs on the non-iron part. And again, preserve sort of the iron for uh, future use and not being corroded and stuff like that. We sort of finished up talking about in this chapter, the idea of electrolysis. And electrolysis is really the process where we sort of supply energy and as we supply energy to make really a, a non-spontaneous process occur. So a simple example like we talked about was, for example, the electrolysis of water. You could take something like a nine volt battery or something like that and essentially um, 
you know, hook it up with some electrodes, put some water in there. You'll need a little bit of acid in there to kind of help out. And basically by running that electrical current through it, it's gonna cause basically the reverse reaction to occur. And it's going to basically break apart something like water. And we would get hydrogen gas and oxygen gas which is normally not a spontaneous process, right? When we kind of blow through that, we don't usually get hydrogen gas and oxygen gas under normal conditions, but again, running that electrical current through it is able to do that. Same thing, for example, if we take sodium chloride, which is an ionic compound, again, we don't typically get, you know, the sodium metal back and the chlorine gas back under normal conditions. Um, <clears throat> But again, if you sort of run electrical current over it, you can get back, you know, your solid metal in the molten form and your toxic green uh, gas by doing so. And remember that sort of the process that's occurring here is maybe opposite of what we normally think about when we think about something like sodium chloride. In this case, we're actually starting with a sodium with a plus one charge and a chlorine with a minus one charge and we're trying to make sodium with no charge and chlorine also with no charge in terms of oxidation number. So our sodium here is actually going from plus one to zero while our chlorine is going from minus one uh, to zero as well. And in this particular case, if you think about that number line, in the case of the sodium, it is going from plus one to zero. It is heading in this direction, which means it's going through reduction. And the chlorine in this case is starting at negative one and heading towards zero, which means it is actually going through oxidation. So if you were to break this apart and to say it's half reactions, when we look at our sodium, it should be two Na plus plus a couple of electrons. Uh, making 2Na solid. While on the other side here, we would have our two Cl minuses and our Cl2 plus a couple of electrons happening in terms of our reaction. Obviously, if you get rid of the electrons, you get our overall reaction that is taking place. So again, we're sort of doing the opposite process of what a lot of people sort of think about in terms of those reactions. Now, we also talked about sort of calculations that are involved in those, and usually it's a pretty straightforward sort of calculation. You're usually told how long you're running it, so how long you're going to run this cell, maybe hours or whatever it may be. You're also usually given the amperage at which you're running it, so say you run it for four amps. And an amp is a coulomb over second, which is an important relationship. Uh, because you could then take your hours and convert it into seconds and basically take your seconds times your amperage, which is in coulombs per second, gives you coulombs of charge. Here you can then use Faraday's constant, 96,500-ish per mole of electron, gives you the moles of electrons. And at this point, that's where having sort of the balanced half reactions are really important because this will allow you to, for example, if we go back here, we can see that for every two moles of electrons, we get two moles of the solid sodium. Same thing here for every two moles of electrons, we get actually one mole of chlorine gas. So we could get the right relationship there and you could use that to go from say moles of electrons to moles of whatever you're interested in. Once you do that, you will get the moles of whatever you're interested in. And sometimes we're interested in how many grams we would produce. So we could use the molar mass, uh, which is grams per mole to get how many grams. Now we also talked about the idea of, for example, like, uh, water, when we break water apart, <clears throat> produces hydrogen gas, oxygen gas. So at the end here, you may have to use something like the ideal gas law uh, to figure out volume of, say, your gas is being generated.
So that again is a, another uh, sort of important thing that sort of develops in these type of problems. Questions on that there. Okay, uh, so I think uh, we will stop here for now. I'm hoping this is helpful to you. So um, uh, we'll continue and probably knock out the last couple of chapters there in lab. And that will be it. You could go off and study and all that good stuff. Yeah. All right. Any questions on any of that? <clears throat> all right. So I'll see everybody in about uh, 10 minutes, about three o'clock. And again, we will continue on.